السلام عليكم ورحمة الله وبركاته الحمد لله رب العالمين وأصلي وأسلم على أشرف الأنبياء والمرسلين نبينا وحبيبنا وقرة أعيننا محمد بن عبد الله عليه وعلى آله وأصحابه أفضل الصلاة وأتم التسليم أما بعد فإن أصدق الحديث كتاب الله وخير الهدي هدي محمد صلى الله عليه وسلم وشر الأمور محدثاتها وكل محدثة بدعة وكل بدعة ضلالة وكل ضلالة في النار وقال تعالى في كتابه العزيز بعد أعوذ بالله من الشيطان الرجيم بسم الله الرحمن الرحيم يا أيها الذين آمنوا اتقوا الله حق تقاته ولا تموتن إلا وأنتم مسلمون وقال تعالى أيضا قل للمؤمنين يغضوا من أبصارهم ويحفظوا فرجهم ذلك أزكى لهم إن الله خبير بما يصنعون صدق الله العظيم all praise and thanks be to Almighty Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, who is our creator, sustainer, nourisher, protector and curer. May the choicest of his blessings and salutations be upon our beloved master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, his family members, his companions, and all those who tread upon his path with utmost sincerity until the day of Qiyamah. O slaves of Allah, first and foremost, I enjoin upon myself and then all of you all who have come here to adopt a life of taqwa. For it is only through a life of taqwa, that is to bring in the consciousness of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, can a true believer attain success in this world as well as the hereafter. To proceed, before we go on, it would look ideal if the gathering could come closer, please, inshallah. May Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala reward all of you all. My dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, sadly we live in a time, we live in an era which is so hyper-sexualized. We live in an era where warriorism, ex- exhibitionism, these are the cultures that are being promoted. We men are being taught or it is promoted that we can look at whatever we wish and whatever we want. The women, on the other hand, are taught to show more and more flesh so that they get the attention that they want. All of this, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, sadly, it has, you know, started off a trend. A trend where so much of sins, wise transgression is taking taking place all around the world. If you were to take fornication, adultery, homosexuality, all of this on one side. And on the other hand, if you were to take the case of the youngsters or perhaps the ones who are single, they fall into the abyss of pornography. They hook themselves onto pornography and addiction, which is so evil. So evil that at times scholars say that even marriage, even marriage cannot help that individual who is hooked on to pornography because it is so evil. So many researchers have come up to study about this addiction. It is an addiction like none other. And it is an addiction which needs more and more fuel to uh, supply the addiction, in other words, to supply the reward center in the brain just like some other addiction. And so much to the extent that the individual, he starts off with little things, perhaps, perhaps uh, semi-nudity and things like that, and it goes on. It's so evil, so evil, he keeps on retrogressing, and these ill effects that affect him also affect the individual if he enters into a marriage. It affects both spouses. Because he is living in a world of illusion, a world which is not real, a world which is not real. And he is expecting something that is not something that he, get, that he can get in reality, nor something that his spouse can live up to. And all of this is against the command of Allah Azza wa Jal. Where Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, 
قل للمؤمنين يغضوا من أبصارهم ويحفظوا فروجهم O oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and please remember salawat when I mention his name. O oh Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, inform the believing men to lower their gaze. To lower their gaze. وَيَحْفَضُوا فُرُوجَهُمْ And to protect their private parts. ذَلِكَ أَزْكَى لَهُمْ For that will be much purer for them. إِنَّ اللَّهَ خَبِيرٌ بِمَا يَسْنَعُونَ And indeed Allah jalla wa'az is most aware of all that which you all do. But sadly, all of us, we ignore the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. We ignore the teachings of our beloved Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And that is why we see ourselves in various problems, various problems. We do not take heed to the command of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, nor the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. All of us wish for a good life. All of us wish for a good married life. All of us want fantastic spouses, we want to be good businessmen, but not heeding the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. For naturally, only if we are to adopt his life as our lives, only then are we going to be successful. Only then can we expect success in whatever we wish to do. The sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is so important. My dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, the few minutes that I have, I just wish to touch on the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. For if we understand the complete concept of what is sunnah in its, in its holistic definition, we can apply it into our lives and inshaAllah ta'ala expect success in this world as well as the hereafter. So what is sunnah? Sunnah according to its linguistic definition is a path, a path. And that is why we say the way of Prophet Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. That is according to its lexical or linguistic definition. As for its shari'i perspective or its technical definition, it divides itself into four categories. Category number one, sunnah qawliya, sunnah fi'liya, sunnah taqririya, and sunnah tarkiya. Very swiftly, but I hope it will be clear for all of you all inshaAllah ta'ala. So number one, category number one, sunnah qawliya. This category entails all of the statements of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whatever Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said, goes to that category, sunnah qawliya. All of the ahadith of our beloved master Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam goes to that particular category. And Allah the Almighty brought about great scholars, the likes of Imam Bukhari, Imam Muslim and others rahimahumullah to protect this science of ahadith. There is a complete science devoted to protecting the hadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We the ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, we are also known as the ummah of the sanad. We are known as the ummah of the chain of narrators. In other words, no one can come up today and say, you know what, I have a hadith that I heard from Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and he can't give us a hadith from his own pocket. The reason being there are scholars who would come up to him and ask him, okay, so you have a hadith, so give us your chain of narrators. And these scholars who are specialists in the science of hadith, may dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, are so deeply rooted in that science that they know all of the ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And not only the ahadith, they also know about the narrators. Say you're talking about an individual known as Abdullah, who comes about with this hadith, they would know where this Abdullah is from, who, who, what, who, what is his father's name, he is the son of who, and what is his occupation, is he a student of knowledge, is he a shaykh, or does he have a weak memory, was he accused of theft, robbery, fornication, all of this. These scholars had each and every biography in their heads. And this is how my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala protected the ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Because today, we have a group of people who come about and say, we are going to only follow the Qur'an. We are only going to follow the Qur'an. We can't accept the ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam because the authenticity is being debated. We tell them, how are you going to offer salah? How are you going to offer salah? Allah the Almighty commands us, وَأَقِيمُ الصَّلَاةِ Very concise command. 
establish your salah. If you do not have the ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, how are you going to offer salah? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said, Sallu kama ra'aytumuni usalli. Pray as you have seen me praying. And then the description of the salah goes on. So if you do not have the ahadith of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, you will not be able to interpret the Qur'an of Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. So in this particular category, all of which Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said, has been put in that category. Say for example, in regard to marriage, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is reported to have said, خَيْرُكُمْ خَيْرُكُمْ لِأَهْلِهِ وَأَنَا خَيْرُكُمْ لِأَهْلِهِ أَوْ كَمَا قَالَ عَلَيْهِ الصَّلَاةُ وَالسَّلَامُ The best of you all is the one who is the best towards his wife and his children. Allahu Akbar. And I... Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is saying, and I am the best of you all towards my own family. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. And other ahadith where Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam says, Istawsu bin nisa'i khaira. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam advises us to treat our women folk in the best of manners. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam came to teach us to live a beautiful lifestyle. But sadly, we suffer complexes to look like him. We are ashamed to adopt his life as our lives. Today, if it is a trend, or a particular spokesman, or an actor, if he grows a beard, and that has become the trend, we are all ready to grow our beards. But if it is the sunnah of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, none of us are ready to follow him. Allahu Akbar. May Allah the Almighty forgive us and accept us. We move on to the next category, Sunnah Fi'liya. This category, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, entails all of the actions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Whatever he did goes to that category and we are supposed to follow him sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Say for example, once Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was returning back from a particular expedition, and one of his wives, if I'm not mistaken, it was Sophia radiallahu anha. She wanted to climb the camel that was beside Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Now we all know the camel is a huge animal. You know what our beloved master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam did? Now he is teaching us on how to be the best husband. How to be the best husband. Look at the love, respect he had for his wife. The care too. He goes to the camel. He kneels down by the camel and he places his thigh as a stepping stone for his wife to climb on his thigh and then climb on the camel. Allahu Akbar. Allahu Akbar. Today is it difficult for us to open the doors of the, do, doors of the vehicle for our wives? We're not, we don't have to go and place our thighs for them to climb on the horse or the camel. It's just a matter of opening the door. Curtsy, chivalry, where has all of this gone? The other day someone was saying that if you open, if you see a man opening the door of the, his vehicle for his wife, it's either that the car is brand new or that the wife is brand new. If not, they don't open the doors. Allahu Akbar. So this is from the actions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Likewise, we see there's another incident where Aisha radiallahu anha, she narrates that once there were a few Abyssinian slaves who were playing a particular sport in the masjid. Now we know Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam used to live just next to the masjid. So Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was observing the sport and then he asks his wife Aisha radiallahu anha, Ya Aisha, do you also wish to observe the sport? Look, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam respects his wife's opinion. Today, now, some of us, we don't even bother to ask them, you know what, they're good for the kitchen. We don't have to ask them their opinions. That's how we look at them. Allah save us. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asks his wife, Aisha radiallahu anha, do you want to observe the sport? To which she replies, yes. She comes by Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he stands in front of the window and she stands behind Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. You know the narration goes along the lines of these words. She places her cheek against the cheek of sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and she starts observing the sport. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam waited in that position for some time and then he asked her, Ya Aisha, is it enough? To which she replies, no Ya Rasulullah, I want to watch more. He remains in that position. 
Again he asks her, Ya, ya Aisha, is it enough? To which she replies, No, Ya Rasulullah, I want to watch more. He remains in the position. So much to the extent until Aisha radiallahu anha said, Ya Rasulullah, now it is enough. Until that, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam remained in that position. My dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is teaching us on how to be the best husband. He was the best role model. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the noble Quran, لَقَدْ كَانَ لَكُمْ فِي رَسُولِ اللَّهِ أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنًا أُسْوَةٌ حَسَنَةٌ لِمَنْ كَانَ يَرْجُ اللَّهِ for you all, the Ummah of Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, that is us. For you all, in the life of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is the best role model. The perfect example. For those who have hope in Allah the Almighty and the last day. And they also remember Allah excessively. So my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, to further add to that category, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, and I touch on this on most of my nikah lectures, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he used to address his wife, with loving names, with loving names. Now we on the other hand, perhaps if it's not even in Colombo, outside of Colombo, most of the couples, in the sense the spouses, they address one another using pronouns. They address one another using pronouns. Uh, in Tamil perhaps, Iver or Avar or Avan and all of these pronouns. So is your wife only a pronoun? Do you consider your wife just a pronoun and that's it? Look at the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. He calls Aisha radiallahu anha, Ya Humaira. Now Humaira was not her name. Humaira was not her name, her name was Aisha. He used to call her very affectionately, Ya Humaira, which means, O oh, rosy cheeked one. O oh, rosy cheeked one. So what is stopping us from calling our wives using sweet names? We can call them honey, sweetie, cupcake, sugar, and all of these loving names that concrete the relationship. This is from the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. We're not talking about this from some marriage counselor or something like that. No, from the teachings of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And this is why it's so important for us to understand the categories of the sunnah. It is from his fi'liyah. He did it. So it is upon us to follow him. We move on to the third category. Sunnah taqririya. I don't have anything to touch in relationship to marriage with that. But let me explain the category. Sunnah taqririya is basically the category where all of the approvals and the sanctions of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam go to. Whatever Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam approved of is known as sunnah taqririya. For if he had done it, it goes to sunnah fi'liya. If he had said something, an explicit statement in regard to it, it goes to sunnah qawliya. But if he kept quiet, if he kept quiet, that meant he approved of it. Let's look at the instance where Fadl ibn Abbas radiallahu an and Khalid ibn al-Walid radiallahu an, they both accompany Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam to one of his wife's houses. It was Maymuna radiallahu anha's house. They go there and whilst they are seated, a dish is brought for Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam and his companions. It was a dish of roast meat. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, he outstretches his hand to partake of that dish. It was roasted meat. Now just, as, just before he partook of that dish, there was a murmur from behind. In the sense the women folk were talking. And then someone said, you know, inform Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Inform Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. So his wife informed him, Ya Rasulullah, that dish is roasted lizard meat. That dish is roasted lizard meat. It is the meat of a reptile. Even the outskirts of Colombo people consume it. Something like an iguana. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam immediately withdrew his hand. Now Khalid ibn al-Walid, Sayfullah al-Maslul, the drawn sword of Allah, who was next to Rasul, next to Rasulullah sallallahu wasallam, he asks Rasulullah, Ya Rasulullah, a haramun huwa? Is that meat haram? Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wasallam replies, no, but me and my nation, in other words, me and my tribe, 
we aren't used to eating that meat. You know what Khalid radiallahu anhu did? He pulled the dish to himself and he whacked the whole dish. He polished the dish in front of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam kept quiet. He did not disapprove of it. Al-amru bil ma'roof wa nahi anil munkar. Enjoining good and forbidding evil. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, it is his responsibility. If something haram takes place in front of him, he cannot keep quiet about it. He has to stop it. So him keeping quiet there basically means it's his approval. He has sanctioned it. It's allowed. So instances like this go to the third category sunnah taqririya which stands for the approvals and the sanctions of our master muhammad sallallahu alaihi wasallam the final category is known as sunnah tarkiya which many people are not aware of this sunnah comes from the word taraka yatruku which means whatever rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam left just because he sallallahu alaihi wasallam left it we to leave it for at the end of the day rasulullah sallallahu alaihi wasallam وَمَا يَنْطِقُ عَنِ الْهَوَىٰ إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam does not speak out of his own desires. إِنْ هُوَ إِلَّا وَحْيٌ يُوحَىٰ Whatever he says is divine inspiration from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Let's look at the instance. I wish to give examples for examples bring about clarity. In regard to the adhan. Five times salah, you have to have adhan to call the people to the masjid. So what about salatul eid? What about Salatul Khusuf and Kusuf, the Salah for the lunar eclipse and the solar eclipse? Do we have Adhan for Salatul Eid? No. And why don't we have Adhan? Even though there is a need, we need to inform the people of Salatul Eid. But we do not call out Adhan because Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left it. He did not call out Adhan. So we too do not put our two cents inside there and try to call out Adhan. Just because he left it, we too leave it. This category is known as Sunnah Tarkiya. Whatever Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam left, we too leave. My dear respected elders and brothers in Islam, why we discuss so much about the Sunnahs of Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is so that the pure love for our master sallallahu alayhi wa sallam comes into our hearts. We start to value him, value his lifestyle, and we realize that if we follow him, no doubt we are going to attain success in this world as well as the hereafter. The Sahaba, Ridwanullah ta'ala alayhim ajma'in, perfectly understood this. They perfectly understood this. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says in the Noble Quran, قُلْ إِن كُنْتُمْ تُحِبُّونَ اللَّهَ فَاتَّبِعُونِي فَاتَّبِعُونِي يُحْبِبْكُمُ اللَّهُ وَيَغْفِرْ لَكُمْ ذُنُوبَكُمْ وَاللَّهُ غَفُورٌ رَّحِيمٌ Say, O Muhammad sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, if inform your ummah, if you love Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, then follow me. If you love Allah the Almighty, you will follow Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. And what will you get in return? Yuhbibkumullah. Allah the Almighty will love you in return. Allahu Akbar. If the King of Kings love us, what else do we need, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam? We have indeed attained success in this world as well as the hereafter. For after all, we are crossing through a transitory stage. I'll just mention that and wrap up inshallah ta'ala. Because this life that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has given us is so temporary that there is no time to waste. But sadly, shaitan and dunya has fooled us to the extent. Say for example, you have cricket matches. I'm not saying it's haram. Even though if you were to take the T20 and all the cheerleaders outside there, it might become haram for you to view it. But still, coming back to the match by itself, if you look at its trend now, you have match after match. Now perhaps today or now you have the T20. I don't know what else might come up next. It's a never-ending cycle. It is keeping us occupied. If you look at movies, one movie after the other, they keep putting out movies to keep you occupied. Shaitan is doing this. You look at TV series, you have episodes after episode. You're being kept busy away from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and before you know, know it, Malakul Maut will be sitting in right in front of you. All of us have hypothetical sunglasses in front of us. Hypothetical sunglasses. We can see the grains that have passed by, that is basically our past. And we can't do anything about it. We can see the present, the little grains that are running by, 
but we can't see the future. We do not know how much more grains are remaining. Perhaps I might just have another half an hour more. Whilst heading home, Malakul Maut may pay a visit to me. One of you all, by the time you go home, Malakul Maut may be sitting and waiting for you at home. So the question is, are we ready to face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Are we ready to face Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Hadith is in Muslim. Malakul Maut goes to Musa alayhi salatu wa salam. Musa alayhi salatu wa salam, the minute he sees Malakul Maut, he scolds Malakul Maut. He rebukes Malakul Maut. He tells him, why have you come? You go back. Malakul Maut goes back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and says, Ya Allah, you sent me to a slave who is not ready to face death. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala then says, go and offer him this. Tell him to touch the back of a bull. Tell Musa alayhi salatu wa salam to touch the back of a bull. And for each strand of hair that touches his palm, I give him an extension of a year. I give him an extension of a year for each strand that touches his palm. Malakul mouth comes down to Musa alayhi salatu wa salam. Ya Musa alayhi salatu wa salam. Allah says that he gives you an offer. What is the offer? He asks you to touch the back of a bull. For every strand of hair that touches your palm, you get an extension of a year. Allahu Akbar. You touch 100 strands, 100 years. 200 strands, 200 years. What an opportunity, what an offer. Lovely deal. You know what Musa alayhi salatu wasalam now asks? He asks Malakul Maut, and what after that? What after the 100 years? What after the 200 years? Malakul Maut coolly replies, inevitably I will come again to visit you. Inevitably, I'm going to come again to visit you, to take you. Because this life, whether it be 100, 200, 300 years, it's going to end. And that is what we mean by transitory. And has any one of us got this offer from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? Our lifespan, according to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, 60, 70 years. Allah. If you are 40 today, you have just got another 30 according to the maximum. Today, if somebody lives over 70 or 80, it's a miracle. Time will fly like this. And before you know it, Malakul Maut will be in front of you. The sand glass is up. The battle of Uhud, final narration and I wrap up. The battle of Uhud, there was one Sahabi who was missing, Sa'ad radiallahu an. Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam deploys another Sahabi to go look for that Sahabi, Sa'ad radiallahu an. And Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam instructs him, the minute you see him, convey my salams to him and ask him how he is. This Sahabi radiallahu an goes all over the place searching for Sa'ad radiallahu an. He does not find Sa'ad radiallahu an. He goes all over the battlefield, battle of Uhud. He goes all over the battlefield. Now he's wondering, where is Sa'ad? And finally he thinks, let me go look over by the shuhada, by the martyrs, by the corpses, let me go look by there. So he goes to where the injured of the Muslimun are, and then he hears a groan. He hears a groan. He rushes because he recognizes the groan to be of Sa'ad radiallahu an. He goes by there and he sees Sa'ad radiallahu an on the ground, Allahu Akbar. More than 80 wounds across the front of his body. He is in the throes of death. The Sahabi radiallahu an rushes to Sa'ad radiallahu an. Ya Sa'ad, Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam sent me to inform you that he conveys his salams to you. Sa'ad radiallahu anhu replies, replies the salam back, wa alaykum as salam, and he says, please convey my salams back to Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Then the sahabi radiallahu anhu says, and also Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam asked me to ask you how you are doing. Sa'ad radiallahu anhu replies, please inform Rasulullah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam that I can smell the fragrance of Jannah, Allahu Akbar. I can smell the fragrance of Jannah. The dust of that battle had not settled. But he, in the throes of death, a shaheed, Allahu Akbar. Eighty more wounds across the front of his body. And he says, I smell the fragrance of Jannah. That is success, my dear respected elders and brothers in Islam. That is true success. Eternal bliss. He is going to be in Jannah forever and ever. 
So let us not be fooled by this transitory dunya with her fake wails of pleasure. Let us not be fooled by this dunya. Let us prepare for akhirah. For Allah the Almighty has created us for a much, much better goal than this dunya. Our destination is akhirah. This is a transitory station that we are crossing through a matter of 60, 70 years where we are going to spend thousands and thousands of eternities in Jannah. May Allah the Almighty forgive all of our sins and may He accept all of our deeds and may He grant us Jannah. May He unite us in...